So without any further ado, we're going to crack on. Um, um, first question that we got via Twitter, uh, Hari, going to pitch to you to begin with. What exactly is instructional coaching? What is it not? Cool, thank you. Is that the most controversial one we've got, or is it going to get more controversial <laughs> with time? We'll see. Like maybe Sam will see. Uh, okay. be able to make it more controversial. Cool, fingers crossed. So um, if I tell you, Peps, or the the asker of this question that I've got a coach in pretty much any realm of life you'd sort of have a sense that I see someone regularly they sit down with me they talk about what I'm up to maybe they give me some advice some encouragement um and if I have an instruction talk about that it could be a life coach it could be a fitness coach it could be a sales coach and their job would be to make me better at that thing and an instructional coach is just there to make me better at teaching um, and Atul Gawande has got this, the surgeon who's written beautifully about sort of everything to do with medicine, um, has got this really nice essay asking, why don't professionals have coaches? And in particular, he, he references having, um, he's like, I paid an 18 year old to help me play better tennis. Why haven't I paid someone to help me become a better surgeon? So he does and becomes a better surgeon. Um, so instructional coaching, coaching helps you get better at teaching where it gets confusing. I think, um, I guess when I was a newish teacher, one of the conversations that I heard more times than I want to relive is someone would say, well, what's the distinction between coaching and mentoring? This was meant to be an interesting discussion question for, for a few minutes. And a mentor sort of told you what to do and a coach sort of didn't. Um, and so instructional coaching, as we would see, it, I think on this call, uh, we would distinguish from this kind of pure non-directive growth coaching that you might have experienced there's definitely a place for it and um, there's 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 a time and a place when sitting down with someone and just talking about how you feel and what you're up to is really powerful but we would say that in instructional coaching um there's an element of direction and an element of precision so if i sit down with an instructional coach they're not there to hear me talk about my feelings or just how i thought the lesson went for 45 minutes we want a really clear process that gives uh, gives rise to a really precise bit of feedback and the instructional coach would then support me to act on that feedback so it's a really pointed tool for making teaching better it's not a chance to chat in the nicest possible way do you think that Atul Gwande had an instructional coach or a group coach? well a, a, a surgical coach but yeah I mean his, so he specifically talks about um being in the operating theater and being given feedback that he was raising his arms too high during surgery and that meant he actually didn't con couldn't control his hands as like as precisely as you really want to be if you're operating with like you know so 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 this really expert surgeon says hold your hands lower down you then the movement needs to be in your hands not in your elbows and he kind of resents it and does it and realizes it makes him a, a better surgeon which i think for many of us first time a coach turns up and says try this maybe you haven't thought about that there's a kind of and then, then we get over ourselves and, and realize that that kind of precise feedback can be really powerful. I've got a few follow-up questions, but I'm, I'm going to stop hogging the floor, go to Sarah and Sam, see if they've got any pushes or challenges. So I would, yeah, I suppose my, my push and my challenge would be, um, so, so exactly what does distinguish it from mentoring? If they've both got an aspect of, uh, you know, um, directiveness, what is the difference? Or in fact, is there no difference and we should dump the term mentoring on the grounds that it's you know, too vague? I think mentoring is too vague because mentor is also a, a role. It's like as a professional mentor and mentoring, uh, as I've experienced and I un understand it, is someone who comes and gives you feedback in, in some way. Whereas instructional coaching, I would say, is a very precise process. So where my mentor might walk in and say, here are 14 things that I noticed about your lesson. And we'll discuss some of those 14 and then we'll call it quits. An instructional coach, I hope, will come in and say, here's one thing I noticed about your lesson. And we're now going to work and I'm going to help you to hone that one thing. Um, and that is my well that's not my whole job because clearly that that adds over a, a series of weeks and months to huge changes but I think it's quite different from a kind of generic mentoring I mean I think there's, there is a, there's an underlying question there like we're constantly renaming existing things and it's it's you know is there any merit in it and are people just trying to sort of promote well I've got a new idea and it's called you know green instructional coaching or something um, <laughs> but I do I do think inst I 
I think at the moment, at least in the UK, it still has some kind of weight and merit because it's saying something that a lot of teachers still haven't experienced and therefore is worth hanging on to, at least for another two, three years. Tom. Um, oh, of course. Yeah, Sarah. Oh, sorry. Go, I'm just going to go, go, go. On, on something else. Harry, do you think there's ever a, a, a role for those kind of open ended questions during instructional coaching? And when do you think that might be if you do think that there's a role for that? It's a great question. So, yeah, when I say directive precise, um, I think what matters is that you get to the end of a feedback meeting and you have a really precise thing that you're going to act on, because as any of us who've ever tried to change anything find, if it's really vague, be more inspiring, ask better questions, we're not going to do it. Um, partly because we don't know how, partly because we need our sort of handheld to do it. Um, I, as an instructional coach myself, I found that with some teachers, literally within about two weeks of starting the process, I just sort of sat there and nodded and they would talk themselves through the entire process and I didn't really need to do anything because I'd say, oh, you know, I was thinking about X. They'd say, oh yes, I noticed that. Here's the thing I need to do. Da -da 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 -da. And I think the more of that process you hand over to the teacher, the better it is for, for everyone because you want them to be able to develop themselves. If you walk under a bus, you want them to be able to, to you know, uh, keep making progress so yeah uh, I I but I think start tight and then loosen rather than doing it the other way around Sam how effective is this thing that Harry's just described and what is the strength of this evidence yeah so um yeah I mean we should we should bear in mind all the caveats that Harry's sort of given about the definition because you know, you can only study how effective something is if you can actually define it and delineate it from close alternatives, right? But um, yeah, if we, if we use the, uh, if, we, if we stick to the definition that's usually used in empirical work, which is this kind of uh, ongoing observation feedback practice cycle, you know, where you cycle through that multiple times between a novice and an expert, then we've got quite a lot of evidence from experimental studies. This is well known and has been sort of, you know, um, well publicized that the average impact on pupil attainment amongst the, the subset of instructional coaching that actually gets evaluated and studied is about one to two months of additional pupil progress from taking part in kind of a complete usually sort of year-long instructional coaching um, you know set of instructional coaching cycles um, there's a really good question to be asked about this, which is how do we know it's the instructional coaching that's kind of doing the work here, as opposed to, uh, you know, so in the famous Kraft, Blazer and Hogan meta-analysis, about a quarter of the studies, I think, are all about one type of instructional coaching program, which is uh, my teaching partner and its various incarnations. So how do we know that like this average effect size one to two months isn't just being propped up by the content in that program being really good and actually you could have done it by some other means that's not instructional coaching? Well, I think the probably the single most interesting study in the literature is uh, Cilia Zetau. Uh, it's based in South Africa actually, but it, it's super distinctive because they don't just sort of evaluate one instructional coaching program. Instead, they look at, um, you know, they hold the content fixed, which is basically around a sort of um, teaching kids to use, uh, sorry, to read using kind of phonics and then guided group reading. Uh, but they split the participants into two arms. So one arm gets that content, but via a sort of traditional off-site intensive training sort of format and then the other group group b um, gets the same content but via kind of ongoing instructional coaching observation feedback practice cycle kind of setup and what they find is that um, the the teachers who participate get it through the sort of traditional training route the off-site uh, there's no measurable impact on pupil achievement whereas the teachers who get it via the instructional coaching they get about two months of additional um, progress for for their pupils so this is like really good evidence that it's you know it's the coaching that matters um, uh, yeah I, I think that's a, a super important study in the literature and another way of looking at this same issue is kind of how does that you know this is a category of stuff right some instructional coaching is going to be much better than other uh, instructional coaching and um, when, when we did our EEF uh, review of effective professional development we sort of looked at um, a bunch of studies on instructional coaching um, 
And I had a look back at this in preparation for this seminar and had another look at the data. And actually, if you, you know, just picking out three examples, uh, we've got examples of instructional coaching. There's one called the Pathway Project. This is from a paper by Olson in 2019. That's got seven of our mechanisms in it. Um, those of you who have read our review will know what I'm talking about. And the impact is about 0 0.05. So maybe let's say, call it half a month. There's another instructional coaching program, which is called the PAVE model from a paper by Goodson in 2010. That's got nine mechanisms, so a couple more. And that has much greater impact, about 0.15 or you know, roughly two months of progress. And there's another instructional coaching program called Content Focused Coaching. This is from a paper by Carenti. This has got a whopping 12 mechanisms in it. So it's much more under the hood. And this has an impact close to sort of like two or three months. So we should really keep in mind that there's sort of better and worse instructional coaching within this kind of overall category that we're, that we're talking about. Um, Sam, I wonder whether you want to say anything about the, the follow-up Cilia's paper, which is quite interesting, on when they come back, I can't remember if it's like one or two years after the treatment and what they find there about the, the ongoing impact of, of coaching. <laughs> I haven't read it, so Harry, you might have to tell us. <laughs> um, well, this is more of a comment than a question in that case. Um, so basically, they then come back two years later. They, step, they do this a, a couple of years of some teachers get training some teachers get coaching and the content is the same they come back a couple of years later having to finish the program and they find that the 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 like the teachers have kind of an, a, are not quite as effective as they were unsurprisingly if you've then been sort of left alone for two years but the teach the coaching teachers do still seem to be doing better so, so there's something there around coaching uh, sticking and potentially maybe linking to what sarah was was asking about earlier like potentially the coaches have helped to change the way the teacher thinks about their teaching and what they intend to do uh, that then has a, a lasting impact. Yeah. Could, I, could I ask you guys something I think I would, I would wonder if I, was, um, if I was watching this, which would be um, what kind of conditions affect like how effective coaching is? So is it, is it only good for novices and not for people who are more expert? Does the type of content that you're coaching on matter um does is it important that you're doing some kind of whole school pd and then coaching as well mm -hmm. on the same thing what kind of things like affect uh how how uh how good it is yeah so i mean we've got some evidence that you know this is from the craft uh, blazer and hogan meta-analysis that combining uh where coaching is combined with kind of group activities so basically some sort of peer support group amongst teachers um, that helps it be more effective or that tends to be more effective presumably because uh, coaches can sort of share you know uh, what's worked for them in using some specific area of their practice they're working on uh, but in general I'd say other than that and other than uh, uh, the stuff that I just talked about from our EEF review um, I don't think we know the or rather the data doesn't point to like big differences for example in terms of is it subject specific or is it kind of subject general just kind of pedagogy in the general sense Harry I don't know if you want to add anything to that well I would just chip it now I don't think there's this robust research evidence but I think there's a kind of coherence point is that I quite strongly came to the view having worked with quite a lot of heads of teaching and learning that an effective program means lots of things are pushing in the in the same direction and many of us have probably worked with or know of schools where there's a kind of like you know one staff member's got a program for this there's a reading club about that there's coaching about the other and actually teachers end up so I mean it, with trainees the kind of like my university tutor wants me to do this and my in-school tutor wants me to do that and it's just bonkers and so the more different things can can integrate and support each other the more likely that the, the teacher is going to be able to learn and we know that from our own teaching experience right like if our students uh, hear from us and read a book about it and watch a video about it it's more likely to stick than if they just hear about it from us um so yeah you, you don't have any evidence but you've got some some logic in that i think just one other one other thing that's i think important to um yeah put on the table at this point is um another paper by um blazer uh from 2020 i think yeah we'll shove all these papers in the chat but it's, he, he studies in that, um, you know, what's the difference in coach effectiveness, essentially. 
uh, just in a very descriptive way with this massive data set, which I think is from TNTP. And um, there's three really interesting findings from it. Coaches vary massively in their effectiveness. Um, this is stable across years. So this is not just like noise, you know, a coach is good in one year as a coach is good in the next year kind of thing. Um, uh, it's not explained by the coaches they're studying are sort of trained in different sites because TNTP, I think, have got these different sites across the US and that doesn't seem to explain it. So it seems to be something very individual to the person that explains, uh, you know, why they differ so much in their ability to sort of help teachers keep getting better. Um, and indeed, the, the, it's worth just uh, reiterating this point about the variation. So I said that like the average effect size of a coaching program is sort of one to two months ish. I mean, if you look at Blazer's estimates, that suggests that, uh, you know, probably within that program, you've got some coaches who are adding, you know, very little, perhaps two weeks progress, and some who are adding three months of additional progress. So what's going on at the coach level uh, really, really matters. And maybe we can sort of return to speculate a bit more about this later in the, in the seminar. Sarah, I know you've been potentially doing a bit of thinking about this. What is it that makes a coach effective and does that fit or the similarity between the coach and the coachee matter at all? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, and some of what I'm about to say is, is, is sort of based on research, but a lot of it is just, um, just experience, I suppose. Um, so if we think about what Harry said about precision, um, so we do want during this, this coaching that the coach is able to kind of get across some kind of like precise um, sort of step um, for, the, for the coachee to do. To be able to achieve that precision as a coach, you need to have quite a lot of, um, of expertise in the area that you're coaching in. So you need that kind of pedagogical expertise, um, probably that you've gained through your teaching. But you need more than that, don't you? Because you need to be able to take something you're pretty expert in, that you're pretty fluent at, and be able to break it down, model it, explain it, um, and do all these weird and wonderful things with it that a teacher uh, wouldn't necessarily need to do. So you need to provide feedback that that's very like precise and, and quite specific. It's more than just you know it, vague feedback like you know telling a football player they need to score more goals is not is is not useful. We were looking for like what is it and and how um, and and how can we kind of break it down. So you're going to need that strong pedagogical understanding, but you're also going to need to leverage all that stuff you know about how learning happens with pupils and apply that to. Um, to the coaching as well so breaking down modeling um, and running practice um, but there's also other stuff um, in, involved in this so um, even though there's some some stuff in the research that suggests that perhaps relationships is not quite as important as, as we thought um, I, my experience has been relationships is re are really important between the, the coach and um, and the coachee so um, so building up that that element of trust and detaching any coaching that you're doing from any kind of performance management, for example, such that it's really low stakes um, showing that you're really credible. So if you're going to be a coach, um, my, my advice would be to, to be coached by someone else, because uh, then you get to really um, experience what it's like to be on the other end of it, um, how it might feel. And it just makes you more, uh, more careful about how you do stuff. Uh, another thing that I found really the best coaches seem to do is if they want the coachy to do something, they model it first. So if they want the coachy to, to, to practice, they're obviously going to model it and break it down first. If you want the coachy to be able to take on feedback well, that's something that you can model. So the coachy could give you feedback on your modeling, for example. So if you want them to do something, modeling it first can kind of make it more comfortable and make you seem um, more credible. Uh, so yeah, so those are, are just a few things. Um, in terms of the fit between um, coach and coachee, I don't think they necessarily have to be the same kind of style of, of, of teacher. You can navigate that um, and you're not trying to turn your coachee into a kind of mini version of yourself, so that's okay. Um, but something that you would want to think about is like, do I have the expertise to coach in this area? Um, so there's there's uh, stuff in the research about having but about fit in terms of um, the expertise you've got and the need of the teacher. So that's obviously going to be really important. Sarah, you're probably familiar with the David Berliner paper where he talks about levels of expertise in teaching. And he's got this idea that um, the most 
expert experts are kind of often they're not even conscious of their expertise because they're moving so thinking so fluidly in the classroom so he says actually maybe sometimes you want someone who are like a notch or two less expert because they're still consciously aware of what's going on and they can break it down for others um do you buy that do you think there's anything in that it, it, it would given the choice if you could have a coach tomorrow would you want the best performer in the world or a second tier performer well, or a second tier performer um that's a good a good question if i could if i could if i could pick a coach tomorrow who hasn't been trained on coaching then i would pick the person who was just above me because i think we've all kind of experienced this if you've just if you've had to swat up on some content to teach it you're inherently kind of more you, you understand those steps those incremental steps that you need to get there so I wouldn't want the fluid expert to um to coach me but um if they both receive training on coaching so if expertise is domain specific then the domain is coaching and they need to be trained to be a coach uh, and so if they both had that, that that training I might change my answer and go for the um the more expert Fab. Okay, last question before we move to the floor. And um, if you are somebody out there listening who has a question, um, uh, we'd love to invite you up in a few minutes to ask the panel. So uh, let us know by the chat or the Q&A or just drop uh, Josh a line on Twitter. The harder the question, the better these guys are good for it. So last question, um, start with you, Sam, what, but love to hear other perspectives. What research do you think is needed next to move our understanding of instructional coaching forward yeah good question so um there has been yeah I, I took this as an opportunity to go back and look at the sort of papers from last year on instructional coaching and um there's a lot of people sort of calling for more research on how to train coaches and how to develop coaches and there's a very interesting paper by jennifer lynn russell um, where they train coaches to use what they call deep and specific pre-lesson planning with their coaches. So working through, uh, you know, thinking through, yeah, the specific action steps in a lesson and how they relate to sort of uh, the interaction between teaching and learning. That's basically what they mean by it. And they find that um, the coaches who they, uh, who they uh, sort of work with to improve on this uh, do in fact do better deep and specific pre-lesson planning based on these independent observations. And then as a result, they see more what they call conceptually sophisticated maths instruction in their classroom. So this is like the first paper in the literature that I know of on how to train and develop coaches. But I think we need a lot more in that regard. Uh, you know, there are these big there are these huge variations in effects between coaches and there is absolutely no reason why researchers can't work out what is driving those differences and sort of put them to work. Um, I think we also need a lot more research on the kind of personal factors. And I agree with Sarah's point that this must be critical. Uh, just even kind of basic things like rapport and how to build rapport and trust in that sort of frankly quite intense dyadic kind of relationship. And uh, Ariel Boguslav, who works at, uh, well, she's based in the US, uh, Virginia University, has developed a tool for kind of coding up coaching conversations to allow for sort of systematic analysis of what's going on sort of you know, dialogically within them. Uh, and we're going to work with, uh, with Ariel, Kate Forbes, Dixons and Cabot in, in England, obviously, to, to, to use this tool and to analyse some, do some in-depth analysis of coaching conversations try to understand uh, what differentiates uh, better from worse conversations and then the last thing I mean it's worth just returning to like why did everyone start why did Joyce and Showers start thinking about coaching in the 1980s and so how have we kind of ended up here and basically their motivation is around transfer right they're worried that other forms of professional development just don't transfer into the classroom. And so they sort of develop coaching as a kind of, you know, it's more geographically proximate to the classroom. So often there's like rehearsal happening in real classrooms. It's more temporally proximate to, to the classroom because you've got this cycle of feedback and practice, unlike the people just doing the kind of one-off big off-site session. 
and it's more kind of proximal to the kind of needs and interests of the coachee, right? It's personalized. And so this stuff, you know, the whole point of coaching uh, is around trying to support transfer. And I think there's interesting kind of future avenues for trying to improve, take that even further, basically, based on a lot of the cognitive science stuff that we've learned around how to do transfer well. And so, for example, there's an interesting um, review in, uh, uh, well, it's basically a medical journal, how to, a, a journal around training medics by Castillo et al. in 2018. And they sort of propose um, three ways supported by COGSI of sort of helping with transfer. One of them is around sort of integrating modeling of the sort that Sarah's um, rightly talking about earlier with, um, you know, explanations of the basic science of how that action step, you know, improves teaching and learning. And so, yeah, I'm interested in, I think we should be doing experiments on like modeling plus, modeling plus explanation where the two sort of types of information are really sort of integrated and overlaid on each other. All right, Sarah, any quick additions to that before we move to the floor? M much, much, perhaps too simple compared to, to Sam's really sophisticated uh, answer, which I, I, I agree with fully. But I think more micro and more macro. Um, so we actually, to my knowledge, Sam may correct me, don't have any RCTs of instructional randomized control trials and instructional coaching in England. I don't see that as a deal breaker. And I find it detestable when people say it's not going to work in England, even though there are 50 RCTs in America. I think it's ridiculous. Nonetheless, I'd like to see the EF fund, you know, if we're going to put, put loads of money into other interventions, some of which have not been very well designed or very well implemented, I think we should be testing it uh, at scale here. And then the micro, I mean, it's not that there's a shortage of this kind of research in English education journals, um, but I just love to read more of the kind of, this is a case study of one instructional coach with two teachers and what they found difficult. And here's a transcript of the conversation. And that kind of thing can sometimes be incredibly revealing um, and really help you as a coach or a trainer of coaches to, to sort of see your work in new ways. So those are the two things I'd love to hear a bit more of. Sarah, I'm going to assume you've nothing to add. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, plan is I'm going to pause now for 30 seconds, potentially a minute, and I'd like everyone to have a think about a question they would like to ask during the second half and type it somewhere. No, you can just type it in the chat or the Q&A or even just message Josh on Twitter. So quick 30 second pause, folks to grab a drink, and then I'm going to ask some people to come up and ask some questions. Okay, fab. Thank you for everyone chucking questions this way. Keep them coming. Um, Josh, I can't see you, but I'm hoping you're here. There we Hi. go, Josh. Uh, good to see you. Would you like to uh, see if uh, is there anybody who's keen to come up and ask a question of the panel? Sure. So um, Sam Gibbs has sent the very first question in, and I happen to know that Sam also knows her stuff on instructional coaching, and here she is. She's agreed. Uh, Hi, Sam. Send her live. Hi, Sam. So Sam's got the first question. Sam, tell us, who, who, just a quick, who are you? And then give us your question. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Sam, and I'm here with um, Holly Cavell. We're at the East Manchester Academy. Um, we are really interested in instru instructional coaching. We've been doing it here for um, a couple of years. Um, and we have um, around about six members of staff now that are trained up as coaches that we think use that really effectively. Um, at the moment, we're working on developing our model and sort of adapting it and, and making some changes to it. Um, and another thing we're really interested in is how we train our coaches as well. Um, so what we wanted to ask was, um, 
given the new kind of the EEF um, research on professional development and their work around mechanisms, we've been thinking about the role of goals and teachers setting their own goals in instructional coaching, um, and particularly in terms of like what we know about value and motivation. And we wondered whether you um, like whether you could add anything to like our understanding of the research on that, um, but also whether you thought there was a conflict there. So just picking up on some of the things you were saying before about precise feedback, which then necessitates a precise action step. Um, like there's a danger, isn't there, that instructional coaching becomes then quite episodic and sort of from one action step to, to the next. That's what we've been grappling with, really. Um, so do you see teachers setting their own goals as in conflict with the kind of concept of coaching being instructional? I think that's a really, really good question. Oh, Josh, are you, are you going to answer that? Oh, no, 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 no. OK, um, so. I think there's probably just better and worse ways of doing it, basically. I mean, obviously, if the goal is 100% set by the coachee with no guidance or with no, with no sort of reference to the like preceding coaching conversation, then you basically make the coach redundant. And you, essentially what you're doing is like reflective teacher practice. Uh, we've got plenty of evidence now that reflective teacher practice on its own is frankly not a great way of uh, not a great way of doing professional development. Then there's a sort of continuum from, <laughs> uh, you know, you could be completely directive at one end and like bad directive as well. So lacking in sort of explanation for reasons why something is being, you know, is what why is kind of direction has been given. Um, but I think there's probably a sweet spot, which is just somewhere in the middle, right? And I'd be interested to hear what you found about this, Sam, but uh, where, um, you know, as long as there's been a kind of very evidence-based process in the coaching conversation, maybe you're pointing to some video, maybe you're pointing to some, uh, you know, artifact that's been brought along from the lesson. Um, if there's some research being brought to bear as well, and there's a kind of careful reasoning and kind of co-problem solving process, then I think a skilled coach can get to the point where, uh, you know, the goal that the coachee would set for themselves is basically the goal that the coach um, you know, <laughs> in conversation and through a like joint problem solving process would have wanted them to come to anyway. And there's actually a, um, there's a video on the ARC YouTube channel, which is a pretty good example, building on what Harry said about transcripts and examples of a coach doing exactly this with a coachee. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think I think um, I think best to try and basically dissolve the distinction between have you set it and have I set it on the grounds that a skilled a skilled good quality pro coaching process means that basically they agree by the end of the conversation anyway. Sam, what what have you found, Sam? Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty on point, and um, I think we we found that um, sort of that that's usually quite easy to agree on on on. The goal, and it's not really that hard. What what we found quite useful actually is um, Josh's um, work on learning problems, and and that then helps to marry like the bigger picture of, of coaching. Like we think of it as like more like a curriculum. To think it's a term you've also used, Josh. In that the goal is like the like the destination or the end point, um, but by like on picking these learning problems, um, sort of like lesson by lesson or coach session by session, we can sort of move towards that that end goal. I think the goal is really useful for framing the coaching. It depersonalizes it as well, particularly if it's a student centered goal. So it takes away like what Sarah was saying before about developing trust. It really aids with that as well. I think it aids with motivation, particularly like um, <clears throat> like in the school, it's like in challenging circumstances, like, like where we are, there's lots of things happening to staff at once, lots of like really fast pace. Um, so it's actually helpful for staff to have that focus um, and it aids like motivation and value because sometimes it can feel it's being done to people. So we really don't want it to feel like that. So for us goals and, and teachers feeling that they are setting them, even if actually <laughs> some of that is as leading them towards it is, is really important. I think what Sam's just said has really helped the buy-in of staff at our school as well, because we're coaching across the spectrum, not, you know, with different levels of expertise. So we have got some expert practitioners who are being coached and for someone to come into their classroom and say, you 
need to do this it, it didn't quite feel right and um, whereas actually making it more of a discussion and then working together to come up with that goal has really improved kind of the, the take up and the buy-in from the coaches as well and, and again we've taken a lot from josh on responsive coaching and we've tried to create a model that is responsive at all of those stages so we'd ask for example like um can does the teacher need us to model it in a directive way or can we co-construct a model particularly if the teacher has a lot of subject expertise that the coach doesn't have so yes that's some of the stuff we're grappling with <laughs> we're not there yet but we're, we're trying <laughs> super sam thank you so much uh great question keen to make sure we tackle a few questions during this segment so um it's not too rude gonna kick you out <laughs> at some point okay we'll ca catch up soon joyce i'm gonna go ahead and ask the next question great um so this is from michael he was the second person to ask a question he asked two but i'm just gonna ask one of them and it's about kind of like cost benefit analysis of the time that coaching takes uh there is presumably some time allocation for instructional coaching i.e it takes a fair amount of time it's quite resource intensive is there any comparison with other treatments um that you know in terms of like a cost benefit analysis of like what you know the cost of coaching is my interpretation of that question um i'm going to say the cost comparison if we know it's the most effective way to improve teaching uh think about the, the cost of 25 mediocre hours of teaching in a week as opposed to 24 hours of teaching that are like five percent better at a cost of one lesson cut out um i think more and more schools are saying we're going to finish early on a friday or a thursday or whatever and we're going to make sure there's, there's a bit of time for professional learning um i just think it's a no-brainer because all, all like every uh, to, to inevitably quote dylan william like every teacher can can be better and that's why we need to be improving uh, and if you do believe that then finding some way to get someone in to just pop in every week and say here's the thing you might want to think about and then see if it's happened next week and help them onto the next action step uh the the, the benefits must outweigh the costs uh, that is not an answer you'd get past the treasury but then you can't get anything past the treasury anyway so it's you know just to just to come in that um that actually there's there is there is some evidence as well that like being a coach and coaching can improve your teaching and the, the um achievement of your of your pupils so when you're factoring in that kind of cost benefit analysis it's not that the coach is just giving the coach is also um potentially improving their own teaching so that has it has that that benefit as well yeah and just just as one little additional thing um you know we have quite large senior leadership teams in schools in england i think they're large by international standards um each school obviously makes decisions about what those senior leaders are doing um but getting uh, middle leaders and or senior leaders to do coaching is much better evidence than 99% of all other things that those people could be doing with their time. And so, yeah, I, I this is basically a way of me agreeing with Harry that, um, yeah, the benefits side of the cost benefit equation dominates the cost side. Um, because a lot of things we do, you know, in terms of the evidence base is kind of, yeah, informed guesswork uh so yeah be confident about it <laughs> i could go ahead and ask the next question um so i'm i'm busy um inviting people up left right and center because it'd be nice to get some more people to share their cameras but without forcing someone to come up i might just ask some questions um so the next one is from anonymous attendee who won't, would definitely won't want to come up um an anonymous attendee says does it matter what the, underpin, the underpinning pedagogy the coach supports or believes in? Does what the coach believes about teaching and learning or pedagogy make a difference to the potential outcome that the coaching can have? Yes and no. Uh, no, because, no for two reasons. A, because uh, and like any smart person asking questions or offering feedback can probably help you to, to get better in some areas uh, and B because I tend to believe that ideology is is less important than it sometimes looks on Twitter like if you go into a classroom and there are children disrupting other children 99% of teachers will agree that's a problem and will and coaches and will be happy to help you um 
fix that, address that, whether or not you believe that all children are innately good, or as I have had one teacher once tell me, all children are innately evil until they're taught otherwise. Um, so those are my, my sort of no's. My yes is like some mental models of teaching, some uh, ways of looking at how the learning process are more accurate than others. And clearly a coach who is equipped, who understands our best current guess on how things work in terms of working memory model and, and cognitive load is going to be better equipped than someone who's not familiar with that evidence to explain why students are confused and come up with a viable solution. So my preference would always to be have to, to have someone who who really knows their stuff. Uh, but in extremists, I'd be happy to have any coach because I, I can probably learn something from them. Mary Kennedy would, would kind of say that maybe that first the first piece around different pedagogy might be like better interpreted as like fitting the style of the teacher and um, because you want to the coach essentially wants to help that teacher find a practice that kind of fits that feels comfortable that they can wear and that that is a motivating factor in helping teachers to get better um, so yeah next cue um, so we've had three of these similar questions which are about evidence around video coaching. So John Waith um, and Danielle both asked, is there any evidence looking at the effectiveness of video coaching as opposed to in-person observation? Um, what research are the panelists aware of that supports the use of video with instructional coaching? Yeah, so I take this to mean like uh, the observation part is with the coach not in the room but viewing it via a video right so um i think there are three studies on this where they directly tested uh yeah video versus in-room coaching uh two of them found uh that there was no measurable difference and i think one of them found that uh you know in person was better um i think it probably how to interpret that i'm not entirely sure frankly um but uh, it's worth thinking about just what are the affordances of a video of a classroom, right? So what is the coach not going to be able to see if they're looking at the, the teacher's practice via video compared to being in the room? And the, the risks are around, uh, you know, seeing the classroom as a whole, seeing the way that the pupils are responding to the teacher, because most cameras just point in one direction at once, right? So probably if you've got an incredible video setup, I can see that it wouldn't make much difference. Um, but you probably want to be, you know, you want to be, be cognizant of the fact that, yeah, what, what can you not see when you're observing via a video? Uh, completely agree with Sam. I have been around quite a lot of classrooms recently in which the teacher is teaching and students aren't doing anything in their books. And that's quite hard to spot over video. Um, one cool study, it wasn't a head to head of video or, or in person, but it looked at video coaching in sort of rural America. And they said, one, you save a load of coaching time and hassle. And two, video in terms of affordances allows you to pause, stop, playback. And that is what you see through the, in my teaching partner is actually that is remote the, the lesson is videoed the coach says this clip is interesting the teacher watches it back and so on and so on um so i think you know if if i were setting up coaching in a school i'm clearly not going to go video first choice if i'm a trust and particularly if i'm a trust in cumbria or northumberland i would happily lay some bets on on video coaching or at least try it i was yeah, worth mentioning that that the um that the my teaching partner project or program that uh, is kind of used as the basis of a lot of uh, for a lot of the evidence around instructional coaching is predominantly video based yeah and just to be clear i think even if you've got the coach in the room it can sometimes be helpful to have it videoed anyway because it just supports this kind of analytical evidence-based approach to like understanding what happened in that lesson afterwards in the in the kind of feedback stage so i think it can st still be valuable even if the coach is there Time for another question. Um, this from Jenny. Jenny says, is there evidence um, about different outcomes where the coach is an expert in the same subject as the coachee, as opposed to kind of more generic coaching? So subject specific versus generic coaching. What, if anything, does the research say about that? 
Um, I, th I think the research is pretty ambivalent at the moment, as in we've got examples of subject generic, like my teaching partner that work, and we've got uh, examples of subject specific. A lot of this coaching literature is specifically around kind of reading instruction in primary school. Um, I think you're basically thinking about the, the interaction between the coach's expertise and what you are coaching them on, right? So if it's subject specific coaching, you need somebody with really strong, like subject general pedagogical skills, you know, a uh, strong model of how teaching and learning happens. And if you've got, uh, you know, if, you, if you've got subject specific coaching, and you're teaching them how to use, you know, analytic phonics really well in the classroom, well, then your coach needs to be an expert on that. So yeah, it's, it's an interaction thing rather than, uh, rather than just is subject specific better or is subject general better. Josh, I know you've taken a vow of silence uh, in terms of answering questions, but I think you came to a position on this at Southbank, didn't you? It might be worth sharing. Well, um, so, and I, I'm pretty sure this came from the craft paper, but I'm happy to be proved wrong. So I read that there was a kind of like around about a 50-50 split between what you want to be generic and what you want to be subject specific. Or if I misinterpreted it, it led to me uh, fundamentally changing everything I did in my role as teaching learning lead. But essentially I, you know, the, I changed people's coach once every term. Um, I tended to have a generic as in a non-subject specialist in kind of on purpose for half term one because um, my sense and kind of what our school priority was, was about, you know, firming up more generic teaching strategies. That's kind of like behavior, just sharpening your kind of more general classroom skills. And I changed to subject specific coaching very deliberately in term two. And then I kind of had a mixed bag in term three. That's kind of how I aimed to achieve a balance. Am I wrong? People who know about the research, i.e. everyone else in this call. Am I wrong in saying that, uh, that in the craft paper, it's, there's like kind of like a roughly even split between what you need? Tell me that I am. I don't, I don't know that you're wrong, but I think that what Sam was saying around like most of it was um was like coaching on literacy, wasn't it? And that mm. was the um that was the kind of like the thing where you had obviously had to have that expertise in that area. I think that's right, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and there's an even yeah, so there's an even split between I think roughly even split between programs that were subject generic and uh, programs that were subject specific. Uh, but yeah, I think your model sounds sensible, Josh, just on the grounds that, <laughs> no problem, buddy, uh, <laughs> just on the grounds that, yeah, it's going to allow people to access different types of expertise, which are stored in the head of different coaches, right? And this is, that's basically what this process is about. A related yeah. question, sorry, let's go on, Sarah. I was, I was just going to say, um, I, was, I was wondering whether as a as a um, coachee, as a teacher grows in expertise, um, whether subject specific coaching might become more important um, if they've kind of nailed a lot of generic stuff. Um, I don't know, just something else wondering. Right, which is kind of similar to what I was gonna say in that a related question is um, around like what what is it best to focus the coaching on is it better to focus coaching on behavior management or on subject specific pedagogy or formative assessment um does, does it map does it depend on, on any kind of circumstance is there any kind of are there is there any evidence to help us unpack that question and this relates to a question from anonymous again which is is there a best approach in terms of sequencing your topics for teacher development I mean, at risk of saying the most obvious part of the answer, if the students aren't like sitting and listening and feeling safe, uh, they're not going to learn anything, no matter how clever your explanation or formative assessment strategy is. Um, I'm confident that we don't need an RCT to, to demonstrate that. Um, I think it's handy to, to go back to this question about kind of coherence and, and sticking things together. I think it's helpful to have a structure for the year or the two years or however long you plan your teacher development cycle over so a kind of we're going to start with behavior and then we're going to look at explanations and lesson planning and then we're going to look at formative assessment has anyone understood anything and then in half term six you can do what you want uh, has has a has an attraction in terms of them being able to plan sessions and kind of move the school uh partially together i've not seen this tested anywhere and i yeah sam of you not really there's some like there's a very small scale study that looks at five coaches and the ones that focused on behavior in that sample 
uh, seem to be, you know, do a particularly good job. But I mean, I place little to no weight on that. Um, I think um, we should not forget the personalised nature of coaching. And this is crucial for sort of motivational reasons, really, in that, <laughs> you know, coaches really like it if you help them solve the problem that's in front of them. <laughs> um, and frankly, with the, uh, you know, the early career framework in its various guises, uh, you know, the survey evidence suggests that people find it pretty demotivating if it's overly sort of sequenced such that, yeah, it's not focusing on the most, pro you know, the areas that are priority for the coachee. Um, and there's also, I mean, everybody's very into thinking about curriculum at the moment, right? Um, which is, and there are good reasons for that at the pupil level. Uh, you know, we learn about new things much better if you've learned about related things in the past. Um, but actually the fact that, you know, coaching is a one-on-one -on -one thing means that we can sort of break out of the need to teach everybody the same thing at the same time. And like where there's opportunities to benefit from that, we should. Uh, and also, um, you know, often we don't know ahead of going into a teacher's classroom kind of what the challenges are going to be. Uh, and we might not even work it out really until like partway through, uh, you know, the coaching session, which relates to Josh's thing about like, what's, what's the, what's the problem we're trying to address here. And so, yeah, we shouldn't um, like smother or kind of undermine the potential of coaching to do all these things by overly sort of pre-programming uh, what we're going to focus on. Yeah, I think, I think building, building on what Harry and Sam have said and, Sort of linking to some uh, blogs by Josh, so hopefully I don't mis misconstrue what you said, Josh. But I think, like uh, as Harry was saying, unless unless some certain fundamental conditions are in place, um, everything else is going to be made a lot harder. Um, and Josh kind of links this to like um, Willingham's simple model of memory and like that that attention arrow. And like if you if you don't get the attention stuff right, then like really it's not there's not a lot of point coaching on some of the other stuff down the line until they're actually like focusing paying attention as to what to what's being said so whereas there's not a kind of strict necessarily way that you should you should kind of follow these things and um, that his uh, josh's blog on, on that is, is very useful and thinking about like the change sequence and not just like jumping from action step to action step and area to area and actually thinking, you know, one, one week's not going to be enough to, to kind of solve this problem. What are the sort of string of, of action steps that I need to put in place to actually enable this teacher to improve in this area? Seems seems pretty important. Um, there's like, this might be slightly different for teachers if they're kind of quite new to the profession. There might be a more rigid sequence. I'm not sure. Uh, we've certainly placed a bet on that on uh, ambition in our early career. Uh, framework program but uh, we've started with behavior but within that you can kind of chop and change so there might be some more high leverage things to start with um with uh, for some teachers uh, thanks folks josh we got like one minute left before i wrap up do you reckon okay, well, you can squeeze in a quick quickie last question i mean it's 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 a really good question it may be a hard one and just to say if you've asked a question about making coaches better or about implementation we've not answered them on purpose because we're talking about these two things in later weeks which perhaps we'll talk about shortly so sorry we haven't got to your question what metrics from danielle what metric can i use to measure the effectiveness of the of my coaching program in the first year of implementation quite a big one for one minute um but and also a really hard one 30 seconds Positive and quantitative, like A, is stuff happening? How many meetings are happening? Uh, uh, how happy are uh, coaches? B, go and pop into the, the sessions. Are they following the structure that you want? Do you see teachers uh, coming out with a clear sense of their goals? Do they act on the goals? Are students learning more uh, as a result? Um, there you go. Job done. <laughs> Check the post, Harry. Okay, folks, uh, I uh, want to maintain my record as being a good timekeeper. And so we're going to wrap up here. Uh, thank you to everyone involved. Thank you very much to Josh for being the, the guy in the chair, <laughs> coordinating all of this. 
um, and to uh, Sarah, Hari and Sam for being the panellists, answering our questions. Uh, but also thank you very much to everyone who joined us today. Uh, I'm aware this is kind of like four to five slot is, um, you know, a lot of people will still be at school or in transition or whatever it is. So appreciate you taking the time out to, yes, yeah, have a chat about instructional coaching. Before we dial off, just a quick reminder that next week, or this is the first of three webinars next week, uh, next Wednesday, uh, I think at half past seven to half past eight, the focus is on uh, the, the kind of lead coach perspective. And we've got Claire Hill and John Hutchinson uh, who are gonna be here with Josh uh, tackling that. Should be another really interesting one. Other than that, have a great day and we'll see you soon. Bye everyone.